Let's look at the small intestine and some of the accessory organs which release their materials into the first part of the small intestine. Now look at the small intestine. Remember when you compare it to the large, what's small about it is its diameter, not the length. You'll see that the small intestine is much longer than what the large is. So where the small is about 17 feet in length, the large is about four and a half. So that's why you have to think the diameter when you think about the size. Now the small intestine <clears throat> is where most digestion and absorption occurs. A lot of people have always been led to believe that's the stomach, not true. It's less than 1% in the stomach. That's why 1% is not even given to it back in that discussion. So look at this, 92% of all the materials you eat or drink are going to be broken down and absorbed in the small intestine. That is the bulk of it by far. And when you look at the small intestine, it's got three main sections to it, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Now, these sections are quite different in their length. The duodenum, which is just after the stomach, curves right back up under the stomach, and the head of the pancreas can be found in that curve. It's about 25 centimeters long. That's roughly maybe about 12 inches or so. So this is what you'll see immediately after the stomach, right after that little pyloric sphincter at the end of the stomach and beginning of the duodenum. Just after that <clears throat> will be the jejunum. It's about two and a half meters long, and then the ileum, three and a half meters. So very big differences in their lengths. And back here in that duodenum, you're going to find a couple of circular smooth muscles, the major and minor duodenal papillae. When this muscle contracts, Material cannot get out of the liver and gallbladder and pancreas, but when it relaxes, they can. And the reason you get so much absorption in this small intestine is not just because of its length, but because of its huge surface area. Because of all the microvilli found in the small intestine, you get a 600-fold increase in surface area, so that's huge. Remember that uh, microvilli are always there to increase surface area, wherever you need a lot of absorption or secretion. Looking at the cells and glands you'll find along the small intestine, most of them are just the absorptive cells. So those are the cells with the microvilli, a lot of absorption happening right there. Goblet cells, you always see these epithelial cells producing the mucus. And you have some endocrine cells putting out a couple of hormones. Now again, after that first part, the duodenum, you go through this jejunum and ileum. And there's a gradual decrease in its diameter, not a whole lot. Also a little bit of a decrease in its thickness and the number of microvilli. So back closer to the stomach, you tend to get a bit more absor absorption. A little bit further along, a little bit less. You'll also see lots of pyrus patches, which are just big collections of lymphatic nodules, which are big collections of lymphocytes. Better have a lot of lymphatic nodules along the small intestine because of all the absorption. You're going to absorb somewhere around maybe nine liters of material a day. That's a big potential entry point for foreign invaders and such. So you better have a lot of filtering going on by these lymphatic structures. That'll be covered more in other chapters. And right here at the very end of the ileum, you'll have the ileocecal junction, which is where you find another circular sphincter muscle called the ileocecal valve. All they did was take the last part of the small intestine, ileum, and then cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine, and run those names together to get the name of that junction and that valve. Now going back to the duodenum, remember this is where liver, gallbladder, and pancreas all release their material. But look at the anatomy of the liver, it has four lobes. When you look anterior at the front of it, you can see a left and a right lobe. Those are the bigger major ones. And then on the inferior surface, there's a caudate and a quadrate. So you have to look at the bottom of the liver to see those two there. But also on that bottom inferior surface of the liver, you'll find this porta. This is an area where things are going in and out of the liver. Lots of blood vessels there, ducts, nerves, and some other structures. The hepatic portal vein will be covered more in a future chapter, but what this portal vein is doing is bringing back all the blood from the digestive tract. Anything and everything you absorb along that digestive tract, you want to go to the liver first. We'll see why more that is further along. Then you got the hepatic artery bringing in oxygen-rich blood, a nerve plexus, lymph vessels, and some ducts. But looking at these ducts associated with the liver, Coming off the liver, there will be a right and left hepatic. Anytime you hear hepatic, think liver. So there are these two coming off the liver, which form the common hepatic. So they just merge and run together there. 
No coming off the gallbladder, which is on the inferior surface of the liver, under that big right lobe, it has its own duct called the cystic duct. Now, the common hepatic and the cystic run together to form the common bile duct, and that's going to run into the duodenum of the small intestine. Looking at the liver histology, it's made up of many, many liver cells called hepatocytes. Now, all these liver cells are separated out and divided into these nice little organized units. Now, there's some connective tissue, septa, I think something like a nasal septum is always a wall that divides and separates something. It's going to separate out all these hepatocytes into organized groups called lobules. These lobules, which can be seen even with a low power microscope, are big collections of liver cells. They have six different sides to them. So it's just a big collection of hepatocytes is all that a lobule is. At each one of the corners of these little six-sided lobules, there'll be a little portal triad. Well, if you look at what you find in that triad, you'll find a portion of that portal vein, the hepatic artery, and hepatic duct carrying bile. And remember, bile is made completely by the hepatocytes, stored up in the gallbladder, but the liver cells make every bit of it. Now, inside these lobules, you'll see hepatic cords. And these cords are like tall, thin walls radiating out from the center to the outer circumference. They're organized sort of like the spokes on a bicycle tire. If you look at a picture of these, you can see how that is. And then in between those cords, you got these sinusoids. You see they're lined with endothelial cells and also some macrophages. And you find these little tiny canals called canaliculus, which are found in between these cords carrying the bile. Look at liver functions. Bile production is a very big one, 0.6 to 1 liters a day. And if you look at what bile is, it is waste material taken out of the blood. Look at bilirubin from the waste product of all these dead red blood cells. You lose about 2.5 million reds a day. That's a lot of cleanup work. A lot of this cleaned up the liver. Cholesterol, sodium, things like that are big components of this bile. People consume too much of that stuff along with fats and so on. So if you look at what this bile is good for, <clears throat> well, not only are you putting it into the small intestine, which will take it out of the body, which you talk about waste removal, but they're also very basic alkaline. So they're going to neutralize these acids coming from the stomach. And remember, this material is released into the duodenum, which is immediately after the stomach. But this is also good for breaking down fats. So whenever somebody consumes lipids, the bile is moved into the small intestine with the lipids to emulsify, breaks them down into smaller droplets. You can see secretin stimulates bile secretions, increasing water and bicarbonate ion content in them all at the same time. Number two here, storage. Our energy is primarily stored up in our up adipocytes, our fat cells, and our liver. Now, our liver stores up energy in the form of glycogen. That's how that word's sort of similar to glucose there. So that's basically what it is, is stored glucose. But you can see there are other things like fats, vitamins, copper, and iron stored up there too. Nutrient interconversion is a big one of the liver. The liver can take many things which we have in excess and convert them into something that we're lacking. <clears throat> More of that will be discussed in future chapters there. Number four, detoxification. Now here's one of the big reasons that every bit of the blood and absorbed materials from the GI tract comes back to your liver. We can absorb some harmful materials across the wall of that small intestine. Well, you want to take every bit of that first to your liver and let it remove that material. So the liver is very good at removing harmful and foreign chemicals out of the blood before they have a chance to go anywhere else in the body and do harm. But notice how to also remove ammonia and convert it to urea. And that's the number one waste product found in the urine. Number five here is phagocytosis. There's lots of macrophages eating up material that you don't want out in the blood and body. And then when they talk about synthesis, they're talking about making a lot of the proteins found in the plasma. That's where a lot of those proteins come from. So the liver is very big when it comes to the materials you need to find floating around in the blood. Now, also attached to the liver on its inferior surface under that right lobe is the gallbladder. This is just a hollow muscular storage container for bile. doesn't make a single thing. But as the liver makes that bile, it can back up through those ducts. It can be stored up in the gallbladder. 
And that way, when somebody eats a large amount of lipids, they can release the bile in there with the lipids and break them down. And that's what we need if we're going to absorb it. So just a hollow, mus hollow muscular storage container for bile. It's got rougey folds, wrinkles to the inside, like we saw with the stomach, that allow for expansion. It's got a muscular layer and an outer serosa. So bile's always arriving from the liver and stored up here. And then when it's stimulated by cholecystokinin from the intestine and the vagus nerve, that bile will be released through the cystic duct, into the common bile duct, and into the duodenum. You may have also heard of gallstones. Look at what these basically are, a buildup of cholesterol. Somebody builds up too much of this in the blood, the liver removes a large amount of it and puts it into this gallbladder with that bile, it can all sort of bind together and make these stones and that can clog up the ducts. And if you can't get this bile out of the body, you'd be in big trouble. Those waste products can build up and get toxic to the neurons and other cells. But again, along with the liver and gallbladder, you also have your pancreas releasing materials into that duodenum. Now, the pancreas is a mixed gland, so that means it's endocrine and exocrine. Well, the endocrine part's the hormones. There's the insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. But the exocrine part involves a duct. And that duct is going to carry most of your digestive enzymes to the food into that small intestine, specifically that duodenum region. So the pancreas has a head, body, and tail. And that head lies in that bend of the duodenum, as we mentioned before. So the exocrine part is where we have these epithelial cells connected to these ducts, making all these digestive enzymes. And that big pancreatic duct goes into the duodenum. If you look at that major and minor duodenal papillae, you'll see that duct headed there. But look at these pancreatic secretions. Of course, a large amount of it's water, just like with the other ones, but you see ions. And the bicarbonate ion is really important. It's going to neutralize that positive hydrogen coming from the stomach neutralizing a lot of that harmful pH. You can see different enzymes here to break down the materials that we eat. Now again, remember the amylases go with the carbs, so you talk about your sugars and such. Your lipases with the lipids. Deoxyribonuclease breaks down DNA. Ribonuclease breaks down RNA. And then remember any other name that doesn't have amylase, lipase, DNA, or RNA in it, it's going to break down proteins. And down here at the bottom, we have a few hormones mentioned, like secretin and cholecystokinin from the duodenum that stimulate the pancreatic secretion, signaling it when to release its digestive enzymes into the duodenum. So up here again is our stomach. Right after the stomach is the duodenum. See how it curves right back under the stomach? And the head of the pancreas lies in that curve. Then you go through the jejunum and ileum, and all the way at the end of it is the cecum, the first part of the large intestine. So there's a few pictures showing you a lot of these structures. There's the duodenum there. There's the pancreas seen in this picture. There's small intestine, and we'll get to the large soon enough.